Welcome to the Wyoming Women's Business Center's webinar series. Today we are going to be discussing the 10 reasons to write a business plan and how to do it. For many people the planning process is extremely challenging and putting a plan on paper sometimes becomes a roadblock. But the fact is that startups with a plan are two and a half times more likely to get into business. Today we are going to visit with Lisa Wagner, strategic planner extraordinaire. Lisa has worked in small business and economic development for over 18 years and small business lending for 14 years. In the last seven years she has worked with community lenders, small businesses, and nonprofits across the country as a consultant and trainer. And we're extremely appreciative of the time that Lisa spends on our loan review committee for the Wyoming Women's Business Center as well as her time today on this webinar. So Lisa, let's, let's get started and learn about the essentials of a good business plan. Okay, well welcome everybody. Uh, so the reason why you write a plan can impact what you include in it, and we'll talk about that a little bit as we go through this today. So let's just jump in. Um, what we're gonna cover today is I'm gonna talk about the reasons you should write a plan. There's actually a lot of reasons to do it. And what, what are the essential things that need to be included in that plan? And I want to give you some tips uh, for your business plan if you're ever going to need to use it for funding. And some general tips uh, just in terms of writing a business plan. Okay. So there's a lot of quotes out there about uh, why business planning is so important, you know, failing to plan is planning to fail and all that kind of stuff. But I'm a baseball fan, so I like to rely on the immortal words of Yogi Berra. So if you don't know where you're going, you might wind up someplace else. And this is really the bottom line. You know, if, if you don't lay out a game plan, it's really hard to figure out how you're going to get there. And so that's really what a business plan is about. Uh, so in addition to that, I think Kim mentioned at the beginning of the webinar that for businesses that are starting out, which are all of you on the call, you are two and a half times more likely to actually get into business if you do a business plan. And that's from Entrepreneur Magazine. That's a, a study or, um, done by them. So, you know, writing a business plan can give you the confidence and it can give others the confidence who might be investing in you or be partners um, that you really can make this business happen. The other thing it can do is it really can help you see things as they are. A business plan can really help provide clarity. You know, you may have a goal of making a million dollars and the business plan is going to force you to really think through what, you're, what you need to do, what the next steps are, and look at, is that really feasible? And that's really leading into number four, which is uh, when you actually sit down and do a business plan, it's going to help you confirm the math. So you may know in your head, you may have a sense in your head that this can work, but um, if you sit down and actually pencil out, you know, if I'm going to charge this for my product and I'm going to sell it to this many people, how much am I going to make? Uh, it really helps you see uh, how that's going to translate into a bottom line for your business plan. Okay. Uh, you know, and I can't tell you how many times I have sat down with people and helped them do their financial projections, and they look at those projections and their eyes just open up and say, "Boy, you know, I I never realized that." Uh, I was not charging enough for my product. Uh, or, wow, I didn't realize I had to sell so many of those at that price to cover my cost. So it really can be an eye-opener in terms of understanding how the financial side of it all works. And so in that same sort of thinking, it helps you identify pitfalls. It helps you recognize uh, where you can make mistakes you know, do you have enough money to start? Are you charging enough money for your product or service? Those types of things. The other thing a business plan can do is it can really help you to understand your customers. So one of the sections we're going to talk about is the market analysis and really looking at 
who's in your market? How many people are there? How many potential customers do you really have? Uh, it also can help you understand who your competitors are. It really forces you to look around and look at who's selling something similar to you or what else are your customers buying that they might buy instead of what you're selling. Uh, number seven helps you get organized. So, you know, it forces you really to think through what steps you're going to take next and what's most important. It really helps highlight the critical areas that you need to focus on. Uh, number eight, it holds you accountable. So this is actually really important. If you think about, I don't know if, if any of you have ever, you know, kids coming up on the new year, so if you're like me, I set this goal right every January, okay, I'm going to lose 10 pounds. Um, but then, you know, I have my goal, but, but I usually don't have a plan tied to that goal. And so a business plan is very much the same. You may have a goal for your business, an idea of what you want to achieve, but if you don't write it down and you, and you don't share it with somebody, you're not accountable. And so a business plan really serves to do that. And if you think about two of the most successful programs in the country for achieving goals, those are Weight Watchers and Alcoholics Anonymous. And they share those same two principles. One, if you have a goal, you write it down. And two is that you make the plan on how you're going to get to the goal. So instead of just saying, gee, I'm going to lose 10 pounds, I'm actually going to set down my plan is going to include how I'm going to get to that goal, right? I'm going to have to exercise three times a week, and I'm going to have to cut out desserts during the week, right? This is my plan of how I'm going to get there. And then I share that. When I share that plan with somebody else, now I become accountable. And not surprisingly, people who write down their goals and then share those goals and those plans with somebody else are extremely more likely to achieve their goals. And so a business plan can serve that purpose for you. So when you write your plan, uh, be sure to share it with somebody. If you're not going for funding or you don't have a partner who you would automatically share it with, share it with a family member or mentor. And it'll really help you uh, be accountable for working towards achieving those goals. And then, of course, talking about goals, it helps you establish the benchmarks that you need towards achieving those goals. And then last, but certainly not least, uh, which most people I talk to and work with who have done business plans, they're doing it because they want to get money. They want a bank loan or they want an investor or partner. So there's a lot of really great reasons to do it. And I encourage you, particularly if you're looking at starting a new business, uh, to sit down and take the time to sort of pencil through some of these things. So what should your business plan include? You don't want something that's too short and you don't want something that's too long, right? OK. So really, I remember when I had to write my first business plan. And I think the most intimidating thing about it was that it just seemed like there was so much information and it was so complicated. And really, business plans are not rocket science. They're really pretty straightforward. And there's just four key questions that you're going to answer when you write a business plan. You want to be sure to address what is it that you're going to sell. Right? What's your product or service? How are you going to get it? Get your customers to buy it? This is really, really important. Right? You may have the greatest product. You may offer the greatest service. But if there are no customers out there to buy it, it doesn't matter. The third one is the financial side. Right? Show me the money. Can you make money doing this? And this is really about your financial projections and the assumptions that go into it. You know, how many of your product do you need to sell? How much do you need to charge for it? How much is it going to cost you to do it? And then the, the last piece, which is also really important, is who is responsible for making this happen? So if you're a sole proprietor and you're just starting out creating your um, first business, it's just going to be you. The buck's going to stop with you, right? But you also want to talk about if you're going to have other key people helping you or if there's a partnership involved, um, or multiple people involved in owning and running the business. Okay, So we're going to talk about these in a little bit more detail when we uh, go through what a typical business plan looks like. 
So what I have up on the screen now is an example of a sample table of contents. You may see, if you Google business plans uh, on the internet, you'll find you know, varying um, examples of this same table of contents. And really, they're picking up all the key pieces. You may see some of these pieces show up in slightly different places. But this is really, if you hit these pieces here, you're going to answer those four questions that we talked about, OK? And we're going to go through each of these in just a little bit more detail. OK, so executive summary. Uh, this is, in some ways, the easiest piece. Uh, it's really just summarizing what's in your plan. And make sure you hit those four key questions. You know, what got you to where you are now? What does your business do? What are the qualifications of who's going to be managing this business? You know, what are your goals? And how are you going to get there financially? Really, you know, this shouldn't be more than a page. And the reason I say that is, you know, if you're writing your business plan for yourself, the executive summary can kind of help you summarize the key pieces. If you're writing it for someone else, a funder, for example, a lender um, or an investor, they may never get they may not get too much further past the executive summary in terms of the writing. Some some lenders will jump right to your financial statements and your financial projections. So you want to make sure that you hit key pieces here in this executive summary. Uh, it's also a great place to really catch the attention of someone if you are looking for money. Okay. The second section is management and organization. So this goes to the question of really who is responsible. I mean, who's going who's gonna to make this happen? Who's going to make this plan happen? And that's a really um, essential question that any funder is going to be looking at and that you as well should be thinking about. So obviously, if you're writing this just for yourself and you're not looking for financing, you don't need to spend a whole bunch of time detailing the legal structure, although you do want to think through what's the appropriate legal structure for your business. So yeah. if you're starting out and you're just going to be providing a service and you don't have a lot of assets, a sole proprietor might be the best um, option. If you're going to be starting a retail store where you're having people coming in and you have some personal assets, you might want to look at a corporation. There's a lot of resources out there that can um, help you figure this out. You definitely want to be thinking about it. And you want to be thinking about how the business is going to be run. Okay, So who's going to be managing it? Are you going to be managing it? And in most cases, for startups, that is the case. You're both the manager and the main employee, sometimes the only employee. But if you're going to have multiple employees, be clear about who's managing it, what their responsibilities and qualifications are. And you know, are you going to use somebody from uh, who's not an employee to help you? So one tip is that you know, if there are certain skills that you need, find somebody and you don't have, find somebody who can help uh, mentor or provide support to you. The, the most common place that we see this, of course, is in accounting and bookkeeping. And if you are going to be using your business plan to look for financing, it's going to be really important that you be able to keep good books and good accounts. And any funder is going to be looking for that. Okay? Also, if you're not, even if you're not going for financing, uh, it's really good to really think through this section, particularly if you're going to have a partner. So I, always, I, I once heard somebody say partnerships are the only ships that never sail. Um, mostly that's because when you start out, if you have a partner, you know, everybody's positive, you have these ideas, and everything's great. What happens is down the road when there become problems or issues, and you don't have anything in writing. So if you're going to have a partner, really sit down and think about who's doing what, who's responsible for what, how are you going to divvy up the assets and the profits of the company, put that in writing. So let's move into products and services. So the products and services section is really about um, what is it, you know, that first question of the four, what are you going to sell? Okay, so are you going to sell a product? Are you selling a service? 
describe the different types of products if you're going to have varying different types. Uh, what are their features? Do they have unique features? You know, uh, if you're opening up an art store, for example, what type of art are you going to be selling? Um, also, if, you, if you're providing a service, what are the list of services that you'll be providing? If you're going to be starting a web design uh, service, for example, uh, you know, will you be doing hosting? Will you be, you know, what are all the things that you're going to be charging for and providing to your customers? And then, of course, you want to have a detailed description of how you're going to price these things. This section is really going to make you, force you to think about how are you going to set different prices. Will you provide bulk pricing uh, if you have customers who are buying in bulk? Uh, will you provide discount pricing for certain um, markets? You know, these are the types of things you want to think about and really um, define very clearly in this section. Next is you want to uh, cover the market and the marketing plan. This will often be in two different sections. So when we're talking about the market, we're really talking about who is your potential customers? Who are you going to be targeting to buy your product or service? This is really, really important, this market and marketing plan section if you're going for financing. Because as I mentioned before, you may have a great, you may produce this wonderful um, incredible product that nobody's going to buy, right? So one of the things that you want to make sure, this is such a critical piece that I think often gets overlooked when by, by entrepreneurs and small business owners is who's going to buy this thing, you know? Am I really going to be able to get enough customers to make this work? And so you want to describe, be as specific as you can about describing your market. The great thing about the internet is we can find out a lot of information about our potential customers on the internet by doing searches, right? I mean, you know, is your target market male or female? Is there a certain age? Is it a certain geographic area? You know, if you're a retail store, are your customers your local and will you also be selling online? which means you will also have a much broader reach. Um, so think about you know, what type of product service you have and who is actually going to come and buy your product and then describe who those folks are. Look, um, why are they going to buy it? Why would they choose your product or service over somebody else's, right? So that sort of jumps down to who are your competitors. Who else is doing what you're doing? One thing I want to tell you is if you're writing a business plan and you're thinking about competitors, a lot of times I see people say, well, I don't have any competitors. And that is never, ever true. You always have competitors. Because even if there's nobody selling exactly what you're doing, you have other people competing for the same money that the customer would, would use to buy your product. So, so really think broadly about this, um, you know, beyond just, uh, so, so for example, uh, we recently saw a plan for a type of um, software, which is very detailed software, and it's really powerful software and can do a lot of um, customer management type of stuff, and it's a great software. And there really isn't any software that does it, and so, but it doesn't mean that there aren't competitors for the software. Uh, there, are, there are other types of software that sort of do what it does, but not as well, and that's what customers are buying now. So think about, you know, what are your customers buying now um, who might shift their money to buy from you if you don't think you have a competitor. So you always have a competitor, just remember that, and if it's not immediately identifiable. You know, if you're opening up a hair salon, obviously you can look in the phone book, you can look online and find out who are the other hair salons, who are the other nail salons in your community, right? If you have something that's a little bit more different, a little bit more unique, um, make sure that you're thinking more broadly about who those competitors might be. Okay, and so how large is your market? How big are the potential customers, the number of customers who might buy your product or service. And again, that depends a lot on what it is that you're selling. Uh, one of the things that you can do 
you know, online research is great, um, but another thing that can be really, really helpful here is to actually go out and talk to potential customers and do surveys. I mean, I've seen lots of business plans where people will actually stand at the grocery store and ask customer, potential customers questions. And so then, particularly if you're selling something locally, you can really get a sense about um, what people want. You know, if you have, if you're selling, let's say you're doing some sort of wholesale and, you know, actually calling up potential customers to find out would they possibly buy your product, particularly when you're startup. So one of the biggest um, unknowns when you're starting up is who's really going to buy your product or service, right? So try to think creatively about how you can really find out how many people realistically do you think are going to buy this product or service that you have. This is a really, really important piece, and lenders place a high emphasis on this because, again, you got to have people buying it in order to make the business work, right? So don't shortchange your efforts in this area. So industry, it's good to talk about the industry. So for example, you know, is your industry growing or is it shrinking? Are you having more or less competition? Uh, so for example, you know, back in 2007, I was working for a small business lender and we were doing a lot of loans to housing contractors. So, you know, if you remember what happened in 2007, all of a sudden the housing industry was collapsing. So even though we had, may have had applicants who had really great history, a great product and service, we were very nervous about um, supporting any businesses going into that industry at that time. So you need to think about what's happening in that market or industry. Um, so you're thinking down the road a few years, you know, three to five years. Uh, Technology is another great example of that. You know, if you're creating some sort of technology that's going to become obsolete in a few years, that's something you want to be thinking about. And then the last piece is really um, how will customers um, buy your product or service? So how are you actually going to get this product or service to them? Is it, you know, if you're a retail store, they're coming into your store, and they're buying it from you right there, right? If you're selling online, you might be shipping it out. Um, if you're selling a service, how is it that you're providing that service? Are you providing it in an office? Are you um, going to their home? So really, what's the channel that you're going to deliver that product or service to your customer, okay? And if you, if you really dig into these questions and, and answer them, um, that's going to help you define your market and create your marketing plan. Your marketing plan is really about how are you going to let people know about you and how are you going to, um, what's the channel they're going to use to buy your product or service? And how are you going to set that up and make that work? Okay? So that's kind of a big meaty topic and it's a really, really important one that I think gets overlooked a lot. People focus a lot on the nuts and bolts of a business which are really important and I'm a numbers girl so I'm all for that but don't forget the importance of the market and the marketing plan when you're working on your business plan. And I think when you start looking into those things, a lot of times it really will open your eyes to some of the challenges and pitfalls and help you come up with solutions to address them. Okay, so let's talk about the operating plan just a little bit. So in your operating plan section, this is where you're really thinking through the nuts and bolts of your operation, right? Who's doing the work? Um, many times for, for micro enterprises, it's just going to be you, the owner, right? Um, maybe you're uh, creating some artwork that you're going to sell at trade shows in the state or through local retail outlets or online outlets. So you're really doing the work. You're doing it in your home. Um, you're buying the supplies online. You know, so it's really those details of how is that product or service going to get made. And you know, if you're an auto mechanic, you might be doing it in a shop. Uh, you know, so these are the things. You know, what are going to be? What are your hours of operations? Are you going to have to have employees? Um, you know, how are you going to get your product out to your customers? You're going to ship that, you know, that sort of over, overlaps what we talked about in the marketing plan. Okay, so you want to be sure to think about all of these pieces of your business and how it's actually going to happen. 
will you need suppliers? And if so, who are going to be your suppliers? Are they going to be local stores? Are they going to be online folks? Um, you know, these are the type of things you want to be thinking about. And if you're an existing business writing a plan, a lot of times existing businesses are writing plans because they're looking at growing. They're looking at adding a new product or expanding into a new market. And that's where you really want to work through these particular issues of what's going to be added new to your business. Okay. Okay, so let's talk about the last piece, really, um, other than the appendices, which is my favorite part being the, the anal numbers girl that I am, and that's the financial plan. And the reason that I think the financial plan is so important is because all of the things that we just talked about, really all of those assumptions now get reflected in your financial plan, right? So we talked about, you know, how big is your market? How many customers realistically can you serve? You're going to have to estimate, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sell you know, 50 um, t-shirts a week at, you know, $20 a t-shirt, and th these are all my costs for each t-shirt. So it really forces you to take that planning that you've done to look at all of those pieces and put them into numbers. And as I mentioned at the beginning, I can't tell you how many times I've worked with folks, sat down with them, and helped them work through their projections and their eyes open to obstacles in the business, pitfalls, things they need to address or fix. Um, a lot of times what happens is people recognize they're not charging enough for what they're doing. And so once you've gone through the financial pieces, what you'll do last, because you'll have to go through each of these other areas first and can think about these questions and answer them. Uh, and then make sure all of those assumptions are consistent with what you put in your financial projection. Okay? You want to make sure you're thinking about right, your income, what are you selling, what's the income you're bringing in, what are all of the costs associated with the work that you're doing. You want to include, for, you know, for your startup businesses, you want to include what are the costs that you need to open your doors. So you might need to get inventory. Uh, you might need to get licenses. Uh, you know, those types of things. And so most typically in a business plan, you see three years of projected cash flow. Um, for financing, most funders are going to be looking for that first year to be by month, each month. And that is because in that first year, of course, you know, you might show that you have positive cash flow, but maybe in month one, two, and three, you have negative cash flow, right? Because you really ha are just starting to sell. So you're going to need to show that you can come up with the cash to cover that negative cash flow until you're selling enough of your product or service. And that's oftentimes where a lender will come in, or an investor, or a family member. Uh, cash flow, of course, is one of the biggest killers of small businesses. So not having enough cash to order more inventory so that you can sell more products or services, or not having enough cash to pay employees, uh, these will put, put you out of business. So really that first year, I would strongly encourage you to look at it by month so that you can see at the end of each month, are you positive or negative? And if you're negative, you need to come up with a way to address that, either some outside money, maybe you need to save up a little bit more money before you start, you know, maybe there are ways you can bootstrap some of your expenses. If you're an existing business, you're going to want to include, you know, look at your historical financials and make sure that your projections are not inconsistent with those. So if you look at your historical financials and, you, you know, your sales are going to double from last year to this year, um, you better make sure you can justify that. And you better make sure that your expenses are growing with those increased sales also. Okay. So really important in the financial piece to understand your assumptions. They're the most critical, right? How many am I going to sell? What's the price? What's the cost uh, for each of these? And what's my overhead cost, my salaries, my rent? The other thing I'll say in this area, because quite, quite typically the financial 
projections and the financial analysis. Um, for most entrepreneurs, it's not the thing they're strongest in. You know, most entrepreneurs and small business owners are really good in the product or service that they're selling. That you know, you learn the skill. Um, you've done something. Um, that you're interested in and that's what drives you to want to start that business and you know that product or service really well but the business management side of it is not something that many of us have experience with. And so there is help out there uh, in terms of doing your financial plan. There's a lot of good tools and templates online. Uh, SBA.gov is a great, actually a great resource. It's a small business administration. They have cash flow templates. They have all kinds of free online tutorials about, I mean, I think they have one for writing a business plan, creating a marketing plan, identifying your market, all these pieces that, that I've been talking about. They have some great resources online um, for, for helping with that. Uh, Okay, so then the other thing, I think I mentioned this, but just make sure when you do your financial plan, when you sit down and put the numbers to everything, that it meshes with what you've written in your plan earlier, right? So it meshes with how the nuts and bolts of the operations are going to work. You know, so if you're open 8 to 5 and you have to have employees, make sure the number of hours that you're paying employees is consistent with what you're saying or your your operating hours. You know, if you say you're gonna sell, uh, you know, a hundred t-shirts, make sure you've got your cost for a hundred t-shirts in there. Those types of things. So go back and make sure everything sort of meshes up. Okay? There are a lot of tools and a lot of help out there uh, for you if you decide to do that. And I'll, and I'll talk about a couple other resources in just a minute as well. Okay, so the last piece of the business plan, and this is really if you're going to be presenting this to funders, is the appendices. And so in the appendices, you want to include resumes of the key people involved, and in some cases, that might be just you as the business owner. Um, but if you're going to have some key employees, a manager, for example, or a partner, or an advisor, or you're going to be hiring um, an accountant, you know, be sure to include their information as well. Uh, marketing material, so if you've already developed marketing materials, if you have a website, if you have brochures or a flyer, um, be sure to attach those. That, that gives some legitimacy to your plan and shows that you've already taken the steps to do that, particularly if you're a startup. Uh, any licenses, if you need any licenses or permits, you want to be sure to attach those. Any industry information, so remember in the market and marketing plan, we talked about industry information. So anything that you um, have found that's going to support showing that people will buy your product or service, attach that. So then it's not just you, know, you saying it, you actually are showing where that information is coming from. And then of course, if you have any contracts or partnership agreements, um, if you're incorporating, you want to include your articles of incorporation, those kind of things. Uh, so those are really the key things, sort of the extra stuff to, to show um, supporting documentation for what you have in your business plan. Okay? And this is primarily if you're going to be um, presenting a business plan to get financing in some way. Okay, so I want to wrap up with a few tips and answering a few um, questions. So, you know, a couple of things. Uh, if you're going to a funder with your business plan it's, and they don't know you well, this is their first impression of you. So, you know, just use spell check. <laughs> I mean, I've seen a lot of business plans that um, people just spell words wrong, the grammar is really bad, and and some fun, some funders will be okay with that, but remember, this is your first impression unless you know them really well and they know you. So you know, just make sure it's sort of clean and tidy. Uh, know your numbers, okay? So sometimes people will go and get help with their financial projections and not really understand the numbers that went into them. And if you do that, it really doesn't 
help you in any way. It doesn't help you understand what's really going to happen in your business. And if you're going for funding and a funder asks you questions, they're going to ask you questions about your numbers and you can't answer, that's going to be a problem. And it's going to really significantly decrease your chances of getting funding. So, you know, explain your assumptions. I, I talked about that a little bit. Be clear about, you know, if you say you're going to double your um, sales, how is it that you're going to do that? Why are you going to be able to do that, you know? Um, provide more details instead of less. So if, if you're not sure uh, whether you should provide something or not, just provide it is what I would say. Um, anything to, to, to support uh, that you've really researched this, that you've done your due diligence, that, uh, you know, and again, this is if you're going for, for financing. And then a final thing is, uh, you know, we all have weaknesses. Uh, everybody does. And so don't try to hide them. You know, it'll be clear if somebody else is reading your plan, if you have weaknesses in certain areas, what you want to do is address them and compensate them for them. And whether you're going for funding or not, I think the business plan really helps you see this. It can really help you see where some of the weaknesses are in your business. And if you recognize a weakness, the most successful small business owners recognize their weaknesses and they hire to compensate for those. Whether that's hiring a bookkeeper or hire or, or going to the SBDC and getting some help with marketing if marketing is your weakness. You know, those are the types of things you there are low cost and no cost things you can do to address your weaknesses, but don't try to hide them and sweep them under the rug. Um, address them and your business is going to be much more likely to be successful. Okay, a couple of frequently asked questions. So these are questions I get asked a lot. Uh, how long should my business plan be? Okay, so you know, there's not really an answer to that. I will tell you that I think there's been a trend in business plans for them to go shorter rather than longer. You know, you used to see like these 40 and 50 page business plans. And I, you know, unless you're looking for a very large amount of money, um, you don't need that long of a business plan. Okay, you really need to address the four essential questions that we talked about at the beginning. What are you going to sell? How are you going to get customers to buy it? Can you make money doing it? And who's going to make it happen? And in each of those sections of the business plan we talked about, you're really answering those questions. So make your, you know, the length of your business plan is really somewhat dependent on the size of your business and how detailed and complex your business is. Um, so while if you're going for funding, you want to provide additional documentation, I mean, don't just put in information to put it in. It's really, this really should be something that's useful for you and helpful for somebody who's trying to decide whether to invest in you. I mean, I've seen business plans that are, you know, under 10 pages that address all the questions that they need to for, uh, you know, micro-enterprise businesses for sure. So again, it's really dependent on the business. Um, don't get caught up in length. Just make sure you answer those questions well. Uh, so people always ask, can I hire someone else to write it? And so the answer is, yeah, of course you can. But one, you probably have to pay for it. And two, you know, it's really going to be meaningless if somebody else writes it for you if you're not involved in the content. So I also think that business plans don't have to be pretty. I mean, if you're looking for hundreds of thousands of dollars, millions of dollars, yeah, you probably need to make your business plan look pretty. But if you're looking for a small uh, micro-enterprise loan um, or small business loan, what's really going to matter is the content. You know, do you know your business? Do you understand your business? Can you explain the numbers behind it? Those are the things that are really critical. Um, is there software I can use? So yes, there is software you can use. Uh, there's a site called bplan.com where you actually can see sample business plans for your industry or your type of business. I just caution you to be careful. Um, and it's pretty inexpensive and you go through and you can answer some questions. But I caution you again to be careful because if you use that and you don't understand what it spits out, it's really not going to be helpful to you and it's not going to help you get money because as soon as a, a, 
funder starts asking you questions, you're not going to be able to answer them. So, you know, I use that sometimes to go online and find out what are some comparable. So, for example, if I wanted to open, if I'm looking at a business who's who's uh, someone who's opening a restaurant, you know, what's the what are usually what are cost of sales? You know, okay, usually they're 50% of the the total sales. You know, so those are things you can find that can be helpful. I think from looking at some of those business software and example business plans. But be really careful about using it for your own plan. Do I need to use fancy charts and graphs? So again, this goes back to um, how complex is your business? You know. I think the most important thing, again, is, is that um, you understand the content and it's helping you answer the questions you need to answer so your business can succeed. Fancy charts and graphs are nice, but they're certainly not necessary. Um, and is there any free help out there? Yes, there is actually a lot of really great free help out there. The Wyoming Women's Business Center is one. Um, Waldo, who's a director of lending there, is great at helping people when they're applying for a loan to, to get that application completed. Um, let's see, I think through the Women's Business Center and through the Small Business Development Center, um, there's help for actually developing your business plan, free help for helping develop it. So check in. If you haven't checked in with the Small Business Development Center in the state, they're a great resource. Um, SBA.gov, I mentioned them before. And they have a lot of great free resources on their website, really, really helpful, useful ones. And if you go to sba.gov, right on the home page there, uh, their focus is, is providing um, resources and tools for small businesses. And they also have uh, what's called SCORE, which is a service core for retired executives. Uh, and those are retired business people who are willing to, to act as mentors for um, small business owners. So sometimes you can get connected up with a SCORE person, and it's a free service usually, and talk to somebody who's actually been in the business that you're looking to get in or are in and get some um, advice and mentoring from them. So that's another really great resource. So I think I really hit all of the topics that I wanted to. Um, are there any other any questions that, that you all have? Um, or any comments? I, I do have a question here, Lisa. So um, you were talking about software that's out there that can be used to help people prepare their plans. One of the things I saw trending was uh, the idea of business plans for people that are very right-brained and very visual, and they want to have more of a um, pictorial representation of their business rather than a lot of words. Have you ever mm -hmm. used any of those products? And is that something that you think people could get away with? <laughs> yeah, that's interesting. There is a there is a, a sort of a visual business plan out there. It's called the business plan canvas, I think, which I have actually started using with some of my um, some of the clients I work with, uh, and they really like it for that reason. It's a, it's sort of a um, you know, I think if you just Google business plan canvas, I think that's what it's called. Um, if somebody wants to really know what it's called, you can email me afterwards and I'll, I have it. I actually have a copy of the canvas. And it's a, it's a, it's a big um, thing you can put on the wall and you can actually go through with, you know, like sticky notes and figure out what your business plan is. I think it's a great tool for really thinking through when you're starting business, a business or looking to expand or grow a part of your business. Um, I think it can be a terrific tool and really, really effective for that. Um, if, you know, if you're going for funding, I think a funder is going to need to see, probably see it. I haven't seen any funders, you know, really accept that yet. <laughs> um, you know, I suppose if you had enough detail in your sticky notes up there, they might. I think you're still going to have to do your financial projections. But I think if you had something like that, and you know, even if you had a photograph of it, and then had a, a narrative to sort of sum it up and tie it up if you were going to a funder and you had some really solid projections, depending on the type of your plan, 
I think that might be something that they would look at. I'd be willing to bet that Waldo would, right? <laughs> Maybe I shouldn't speak for him. <laughs> um, so I don't think it's going to fully take the place of a business plan in terms of funding, but I actually think it's a great way um, when, if you're just doing it for yourself to walk through and make that plan, it's a great way to do it and really, really helpful for those for people who are visual, which is most people. It's a good question. Well, thank you for that. And thank you for sharing information about um, the services of the Women's Business Center because we do provide a lot of um, feedback to folks on their business plans. And we see a lot of different versions of the plans as well. So that's a great referral. And the Small Business Development Center is really has great expertise at helping people with their business plan. Um, is this something that you do for people? You provide that service uh, on a consulting basis? Well, I, I do. But really, if you're a smaller, smaller, you know, micro enterprise or small startup, um, you know, I don't think you have to pay for it. I think there's so many resources out there, and again, it doesn't have to be really fancy. You know, so yes, I do do it. Um, yes, you know, you can hire me, but usually it's it's larger companies who are looking for bigger chunks of money. Um, you know, that that hire me to do that specifically because I really think the resources. You know, there's some resources around the state. The Women's Business Center also. Uh, you know, over in Fremont County, Winter Development Fund did do that. I don't know if they're still doing it. But where you can get that free assistance and you don't have to pay for it. So, but yeah, I, I do. Okay, thank you. I At, at this point, I, I don't see any other questions. Um, so I think we'll go ahead and wrap it up. We Oh, wait, we do have one one other one here, and this is a really good question regarding how often you should review or update your business plan. I mean, is it something that's static, or or how how do you develop a really organic plan? Yeah, that's a great that's a great question. So, you know, no, a business plan should not be static. It really should be a living document. So, I mean, really, what you should do is once you have a business plan, you know. Ideally, and I mean this rarely happens in small businesses, <laughs> but really what you should do is sort of, um, you know, create an action plan off of that. You know, so if you have a goal to grow a certain number of, to grow your sales by a certain amount, or you know, you have you're, you're looking at a startup, um, you know, sort of set some interim deadlines for achieving some of those things. But the other thing I would say is at a minimum, at a minimum, once a year you should come back and look at that plan and revise it. You know, I mentioned the accountability thing. So, you know, if a year goes by and you go back and you look at your first year financial projections, you go, geez, we're way off from that. Go back and look at why, and you'll be amazed at what you learn. Um, you know, maybe you weren't charging enough. Maybe your costs are really high in this one area where you didn't anticipate, and there's a way for you to bring those down. So at a minimum, you know, you should come back once a year. But but really, particularly when you're starting up, you might come back to it more regularly. Um, and certainly when you have any big changes or shifts in your business, uh, you know, if you're adding another person or you're seeing your sales grow significantly more or less than you anticipated, come back and look at the assumptions you made and try to understand why. And you and I think it'll really help you. Um, make adjustments that will help your business succeed. But definitely don't sit it on the shelf. Shelf, And that's the reason why, even if you're writing it for yourself, if you share it with somebody, sometimes that can help keep you accountable um, to keeping that thing alive. So it definitely should be something that's a living, breathing, changing type of plan. Well, that, that's really awesome information. All, everything you shared today was really we really appreciate it. Really good reference material here. So we, we are out of time, and I want to thank you for the time that you spent with us, Lisa. I'm sure our audience appreciates it as well. And we'll okay, go well, ahead. Thanks and close for having the, me. You bet. We'll close the webinar. <laughs>